Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a recent video that Matt Powell has put out. And no, it's not the one where he thinks that ordering obnoxiously loudly in fast food places counts as a prank. It's one where he says he is going to give the best arguments for creation science. But since the title of the video ends with him hashtagging natural selection and calling it lethal evidence against Darwinism, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and guess that he doesn't actually give any evidence for his specific brand of creationism. Instead, he will likely give what he thinks is evidence against evolution, as though proving evolution wrong would somehow result in creationism being the default fallback position, which it is not. To use an analogy that even Matt could agree with, if I were to prove Islamic creationism wrong, would that automatically mean that evolution is correct? No? Well, then why would proving evolution wrong make any particular creationism automatically correct? Anyway, let's go! But first, a word from our sponsor. Okay, let's see. Make all the animals in pairs, because they need to reproduce, but humans only get one. God, God, we've got a problem. <sighs> what is it, Gabriel? Well, it turns out you weren't using Surfshark when you set up your human and tree of knowledge configuration files over the network. So Satan was able to access all of that unencrypted data. He's probably up to something. What's Surfshark? Surfshark is a VPN, a virtual private network, which is a service that encrypts all of your data so that nobody, not even your internet service provider or the Prince of Darkness, can see what you've been doing. It can keep your personal data protected from cyber criminals like Satan. I see. Is that something I'd have to set up on my laptop here, or could I use it on my tablet instead? It works on both. They've got apps available for Windows, Mac, Linux, and mobile devices, which include some great features like an ad blocker, a kill switch, and a whitelist that can allow specific apps or websites to bypass the VPN. Setup is a breeze. If you don't want the hassle of figuring out all the specifics yourself, you can connect with a single click to the fastest available server. But you still have access to all of the more advanced options that some power users prefer. It allows you to connect an unlimited number of devices simultaneously, it allows you to set up a static IP address if you need it, and you can even get the more advanced security of a multi-hop connection, kind of like a VPN within a VPN. I don't know. I've got an awful lot of devices connected to my network. After all, I'm God. I have all the devices. Wouldn't that take me a long time to set up? Not at all. Not only is it super easy to set up the app on pretty much any device, it's as easy as logging in and then clicking connect, but if you have an OpenVPN compatible router, there are step-by-step -step instructions that walk you through the process of connecting to the VPN directly from your router, protecting your entire network all at once. These security features sound good, but is that really all that it does? What do you mean, is that all it does? That's an amazing service, but it's not all that it does. Because it protects your data, that includes your location data. So if you connect to a different country's server, you can unlock media content that is location restricted. They even provide a smart DNS service, which is kind of like an unencrypted VPN that will work on devices like smart TVs and gaming consoles, which don't have VPN apps. It's not as secure as a VPN, but it'll do for unlocking geo-restricted content in a pinch. But I'm God. I can just be from any country. True, but this is a bit more convenient than having to use miracle powers every time you want to watch a different country's Netflix, isn't it? I suppose you're right, but isn't a service like this prohibitively expensive? But you're got... you know what, never mind. No, right now it's cheaper than ever. If you go to the URL in the video description and use coupon code RHINO at checkout, you can save 83% on their 24-month plan, plus you get three free bonus months, bringing the price down to just $2.21 a month, all with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so it's completely risk-free. Wow, just two twenty one dollars a month? That's not bad at all. Okay, I'm sold. From now on, I'll always use Surfshark when designing things over the network. And you're going to go back and fix the ones you've already done, right? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll get right on. Okay, it looks like Eve.exe has a vulnerability that can be exploited by editing the subroutine in the Tree of Knowledge Matrix. So all I have to do is compile the fruit configuration.
natural selection itself cannot preserve a population. And there we go. Three seconds in, and we're already distracted talking about natural selection having issues rather than giving evidence for creation. I mean, this isn't an issue that natural selection actually has, but this might be a record for how quickly one of my predictions about where a video is headed has come true. And also I see that Matt is still supporting his QAnon bracelet that I first noticed about a year and a half ago, so that's fun. Now just give me a minute, I think I have to go recharge and drink some adrenochrome. I'll be right back. Shit! Oh my god, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure why my camera turned on for that. You weren't supposed to see that. Anyway, back to Matty P. Natural selection is something that is required in order to drive evolution. Natural selection is something that is required, according to an evolutionist, to keep us alive as a population. Not really. It's not that natural selection keeps us alive. It's that the phrase natural selection was coined to describe the ability that some organisms have to stay alive better than other organisms. Natural selection itself is not some sustaining force that is required for life. But the problem is that natural selection itself cannot stop mutations from getting added to populations over generations. Um, no, you're, you're actually right there. It can't, but nobody claims that it does. In fact, mutations are a rather essential part of the overall picture of evolution by natural selection. Mutations are literally one of the primary methods by which new alleles develop. What this means is that each generation, we actually have 100 to 200 more mutations than our parents had. Now these mutations are defined as neutral. Most are neutral, some are detrimental, some are beneficial. Natural selection is what weeds out the detrimental ones and keeps the beneficial ones around, while the neutral ones just tend to accumulate over time. Now, creationists like to latch onto the nearly neutral theory of molecular evolution and use the fact that mutations that are slightly deleterious sometimes don't have enough of an effect to be weeded out by natural selection. And so they can accumulate over time, and this gives rise to the claim from creationists that evolution cannot work in the long run because these negative accumulated mutations will eventually lead to the extinction of the species. But they ignore the fact that there are a number of factors that can mitigate these mutations. Not not the least of which is that there is a roughly equal and opposite category of slightly beneficial mutations. But also there's the fact that how important these slightly deleterious mutations are, or how much they will impact the viability of a species, are largely functions of population size. They are much more powerful on small population sizes than large ones, as it is much harder for a mutation to become fixed in a population when the population is large. Just look at the human ability to digest lactose into adulthood. The mutations for that are, without doubt, very beneficial, and yet those mutations still, after 10,000 or so years, have not reached the majority of the human population on the planet, with some 65% of the world's population unable to digest lactose as adults. It's taking so long to spread precisely because of how big the human population is. Now imagine a mutation that barely has any impact on fitness. Such a mutation would need to become fixed in a population basically through random chance, which will work more in its favor in small populations than in larger ones. However, it still is an alteration of existing information that is functional information. No, there is a lot in the genome that is not functional. Creationists like to claim that every little bit of DNA serves some vital purpose, even if we haven't figured out what that purpose is yet, because that's kind of a prediction that is required for intelligent design to be true, at least if you want to claim that the designer was competent. But unfortunately for creationists, it's just wrong. In fact, given the known rate of mutations, if the entire genome were functional, then in order for the human population to grow rather than shrink, all humans would have to pair off and each pair would have to have a minimum of 272 children, assuming a generously low negative mutation rate, with the upper estimate for a negative mutation rate needing each couple to have 5 times 10 to the 53rd children, which is just utterly ridiculous. Using these calculations, for us to survive as a species with the mutation rate that we have, at least 85% of our genome would have to be completely devoid of function, including regulatory functions. So while there definitely is non-coding DNA that serves other biological functions, your functional DNA still makes up a rather large minority of the genome. 
Unless, of course, you'd like to propose a different method by which it's possible that human populations keep growing despite the mutation rate. I won't be holding my breath for that. And you have to ask the question, what will happen if we continue having mutations that mix up and scramble information over these generations? Well, since at least 85% of the genome is without function, it can be freely messed with, with few to no consequences. All mutations must have some effect, even if that effect is vanishingly small. If the entire genome were functional, that would be not true, but less untrue than it actually is. I was going to say that it would be true, but then I remembered that in the genetic code, there are multiple codons that will result in the same amino acid. So a codon of GUU can change to GUC, GUA, or GUG, and result in no overall change. But setting that aside, the idea that no mutation can truly be neutral lies in the idea that the entire genome is functional. And if that were the case, then yes, natural selection would not be able to keep us around faster than the harmful mutations would kill us off, as I pointed out earlier. And this is one of the ways that we know that there is a large chunk of the genome that is non-functional. And remember, the numbers required don't work for evolution or creation. It would be functionally impossible to have not just a sustained population, but a growing one if Matt's base assumptions here were actually correct. If you start randomly changing DNA sequences and randomly changing functional information, it is going to, by definition, cause it to be dysfunctional. Actually, no. Again, if I grant everything you've said and we still set aside the codon thing that allows us to change functional DNA in a completely neutral way, it's still possible to make a functional change to a genetic sequence that results in changes that are not necessarily detrimental. I say not necessarily here because what is beneficial and what is detrimental are determined largely by the organism's environment. A mutation for thicker hair is all well and good in the Arctic, but it might be a problem in the Sahara. So rather than making sweeping generalizations like this, we should look at what the mutation actually does, if anything, and what effect that has on the organism's life when compared to those that do not have that mutation, rather than just assuming that mutation equals bad all the time. This is why evolution is false, and this is why creation science is true. Now, at best here, even if everything you said is correct, this could only be why the evolutionary mechanism of mutation is problematic. Like, creationists love to harp on Darwin as though everything that Darwin said about evolution is the gospel truth. But did you know that DNA had not even been discovered yet when Darwin first published Origin of Species? Almost as though you don't need to work out all the kinks in how DNA works in order to figure out that evolution is a thing that happens. So if I grant everything, you have not only failed to prove creation, or even provide the most rudimentary evidence for creation, but you have also failed to falsify evolution. And that's if I grant everything, but the fact of the matter is that nearly everything you said here was wrong. So there's really no need to grant it. It's just fun to point out that you haven't actually managed to say anything meaningful yet. This is why creation is true. It shows us that if we go back far enough in time, you would trace back to a single couple with the least amount of mutations, maybe even a perfect genetic code. Thing is, though, there is no hypothetical perfect genetic code. Though that does sound like a testable prediction, I feel like we could really learn some stuff if you were to come up with what the perfect genetic code would have been, and then look at the data to see whether or not it gets closer to that perfect code as we go back in time and look at older samples. I would legitimately love to see some researchers do something like that, but I doubt it will ever happen. And that it became imperfect when sin entered in, and mutations have accrued since. This is what's known in academic circles as an assertion. In order for anyone to take your assertion seriously, you need to back it up with evidence, such as presenting the aforementioned perfect genetic code for analysis. But no, you just assert it as though it were a given, so I'll just apply Hitchens' razor here. That which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Remember, we die from mutations. In some cases, sort of? Yeah, some cancers are caused by mutation and some genetic diseases you're born with can be fatal, but we also digest milk as adults through mutations. We have immune systems that adjust during pregnancy to not kill the fetus through a combination of a past retroviral infection and mutations. And you know what? Basically everything your body does, if we trace it back far enough, has its origin in mutations. Yet mutations are supposedly the thing that drives a fish to a fisherman, 
over millions of years. Ridiculous straw man aside, yes, mutations are one of the driving forces of evolution. They are not some monolithic thing where they are all bad and result in immediate death, and the fact that the majority of the genome is non-functional serves as a protection against them. Or even a frog to a prince. I'm sorry, did you think that saying from a fish to a fisherman didn't make evolution look ridiculous enough, so going one step farther and saying from a frog to a prince would then do the trick and convince someone who wasn't quite there with the fish to fisherman comparison? Or were you just so proud of both of those examples that you felt the need to include both of them? Being able to strawman the process of evolution with multiple silly phrases that all ultimately say the same thing is not impressive. It's actually kind of pathetic. But I wouldn't really expect any more than that from Kent Hovind's apprentice. The majority of his whole thing is just listing animals that he thinks aren't related as though that makes some kind of point. This is all nothing but fairy stories and fairy tales. Says the guy who believes in a literal interpretation of a book with talking animals, witchcraft, magic spells, people with magic strength granted by their hair not having been cut, floating zoos, seven-headed dragons, prophecy. Shit, the list goes on for a while. It also makes the Bible sound way more interesting than it actually is. That sounds like quite the compelling fantasy story. I promise you, it's not. But go ahead and read it for yourself if you don't believe me. Just don't say I didn't warn you. But yet people will choose to believe it over thus saith the Lord. Because thus saith the Lord is a literal fairy tale type story, while evolutionary biology is a useful science that is the foundation on which modern biology is built. Do you even have any evidence that at some point the Lord actually saith a thus? I mean, yeah, the Bible says he said it, but there are so many holy books that say that their God says things. How do we know the Bible isn't just another one of those? These are interesting facts that I think we always need to remember. And they are basic truths of science. He says, after stating his opinion, which is not based on anything that might be considered even remotely factual. Mutations actually cause information to get worse. It is defined, a mutation itself is defined as an error. No, they are not. The National Human Genome Research Institute defines a mutation as a change in a DNA sequence. Yes, these changes are often the result of certain other processes not working properly, but that doesn't automatically mean that the result of the mutation is going to be destructive. To use language as an analogy, there is a version of the Bible where a copying error, or a mutation of the text if you will, changed one of the Ten Commandments to read, Thou shalt commit adultery. This is still a perfectly coherent sentence, despite being a fairly random change in the overall text. And probably my favorite, though less well-known fact about this, is that in the same edition of the Bible, in Deuteronomy 5.24, a couple of letters were messed up in the word greatness, which had the end result saying, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his great ass. Again, perfectly coherent, despite the random mistake, and both of these retain their coherence while completely changing the meaning of the text. Likewise, genetic changes can remain functional while completely changing what the function is through what are sometimes fairly minor changes. So according to evolution, by all these errors and all these mistakes, somehow we've become human. Yes, because natural selection weeds out the ones that have negative impacts on fitness, keeps the ones that have positive impacts, and just kind of allows the accumulation of mutations that have no impact. With fitness here being defined in the evolutionary sense that is purely measured by the organism's ability to produce offspring. Somehow we have become better able to survive in this new environment millions of years after the origin of life. Well, as the environment changes, selection pressures change as well. Had the dinosaurs not been mostly wiped out by the environmental changes that happened after the asteroid impact, it is doubtful that mammals would have ever become as dominant as they are today, and humans likely would have never evolved. Because the environment changed in a way that the large dinosaurs were just not capable of adapting to, and the mammals that existed at the time were small and better able to eke out a living in the harsh environment that followed the impact. One of the most important things to note is that natural selection may act upon a beneficial mutation, something that would help you survive in a different environment. But at no point in history, or in the present, or even in the future, will you see a group of beneficial mutations that will change an organism into a completely different type of organism. Not all at once, no, but you've literally just agreed that beneficial mutations are a thing that exists, and that natural selection causes them to accumulate. Given long enough times, these accumulations absolutely will result in organisms that are quite different from their ancestors and cousins. Dogs will always produce dogs, cats will always produce cats, and we did not all descend from 
a common ancestor. Yes, you're learning Papa Kent's script very well, but it'd be nice if you provided some form of evidence to back up your assertions. I mean, do I really need to get into the problems with the dogs always produce dogs thing here? It's been done to death. The reason that people believe that we actually descended from a common ancestor is because we share similar DNA with that of chimps and other creatures. Again, I would like to point out that common ancestry was put forth as an hypothesis before the molecule of DNA was even discovered. So no, that's not why we think common ancestry is a thing. That is one of the many predictions that is made by the hypothesis of common ancestry that ended up being validated. If we share a common ancestor, there should also be shared genetics. But not just shared genetics, genetics that are shared in a pattern that can be mapped out in evolutionary relationships. And that is exactly what we find when we examine the genes. Now, this is just proof of common design, not common descent. Yeah, God designed us with a gene for producing our own endogenous vitamin C, but he made it slightly broken. And slightly broken in the exact same way as those that appear through other methods to be our closest evolutionary relatives, but in a different way from a handful of other groups that also have a broken vitamin C gene, but are more distantly related, all while leaving most mammals with a working copy of the gene. That sure is some intelligent design right there. It's actually some lazy copying and pasting. Like before selecting the text to be copied, God accidentally smashed a couple other buttons on the keyboard and either didn't notice or didn't bother to fix it when copying that code into his other designs. If that sort of incompetence is what you attribute to your God, then that's fine, I guess, but just recognize that this is incompetence. And that's not even getting into ERVs, which are remnants of retroviruses that inserted themselves randomly into our genome in the past. These insertions are basically random. There are factors that make certain areas of the genome more susceptible than others, but given how big the genome is and how many potential insertion points there are, there are about 50 million insertion points if we're being conservative, it's nearly impossible for two of the same virus to have inserted themselves into an identical spot on two separate species genomes, and yet we have hundreds of them in common with the other great apes. Most of these don't do anything, they're in the parts of our genome that serve no function. So why would God design us with viral DNA that does nothing in identical locations as the animals that appear through other methods to be our closest evolutionary relatives? There are two obvious answers here. One is that God designed it that way to test our faith or something, making God a rather malicious trickster God. The other is that evolution is true. And note that I am not asserting here that evolution being true does not mean that God does not exist. That's a whole nother discussion entirely. Common design means that we are all on the same playground. We are all on the same planet. Uh, what other planets do you think that other organisms might have come from? Well, I mean, judging by that QAnon bracelet, maybe Matt doesn't think that every organism on Earth actually is an organism from Earth. Aren't there some branches of that that think the reptilian overlords are aliens or something? That's the only way that that statement could make sense to me, but I think most young Earth creationists tend not to think that aliens are a thing that exists because God made life on Earth special. So, yeah, that statement just made no sense. And so therefore, since we're all in one environment, it would make sense then that the Creator would design us with similar strands of DNA. You know the Earth isn't one single environment, right? This isn't Star Wars, where there are desert planets and winter planets and forest planets and city planets and swamp planets. This is reality, where all of those different environments exist on one planet. If God was copying and pasting DNA sequences to be specific to environments, then when mapping out genetic phylogenies, we'd expect that the genes would map out according to environments, not evolutionary relationships. And if we take the creation story of the Bible literally, humans were not created for the same environment as chimps. Human cities are very different places from the tropical forests of Africa. The human genome in that scenario should show us as being more closely related to raccoons, squirrels, pigeons, and rats than to the other great apes. And sure enough, that is what we find. No, what we find is that genetic relationships do not seem to care much about environments. In fact, speciation events usually happen when there's some sort of shift in the environment, whether that be caused by a subpopulation of a species being relocated somehow, or just cut off from the main population, or the environment just changing. Environmental change seems to be one of the other driving forces of evolution, meaning that we would expect to find closely related organisms living in different environments, just like we do. But this does not mean that we all descended from a common ancestor and that mutations are what brought us up to where we are today.
By itself, the fact that similarities exist in the genetic code does not mean that. But when looking at specifically what those similarities are, figuring out what the differences are, and then mapping them out, we find that these similarities are highly indicative of evolution and common ancestry. It is absolutely false on absolutely every level, and it is easily falsified when you point out the definition of what a mutation even is. No, it's really not though. Like, maybe if you only have a very extremely rudimentary understanding of what's going on here, with several forays into the territory of just complete misunderstanding, then that's what it might look like to you superficially. But a more nuanced and in-depth understanding shows creationism to be completely untenable in light of the evidence. And just a reminder that this video is titled The Best Argument for Creation Science, and we still haven't gotten anything that doesn't amount to if evolution is wrong, then creationism has to be true. If your best evidence for creationism is just a false dichotomy, then I got some bad news for you about creationism. This is why evolution is not true. This is why creation science is the best alternative. You haven't actually said anything that shows creationism to even be an alternative to evolution, much less the best one. I mean, I guess you think that whole common genes is evidence of a common designer thing counts, but the best case scenario for creationism here is that you looked at two things that look the same and then said they look the same, therefore they must have been made by the same person, without even bothering to question whether or not the person you think made them exists in the first place. Despite the fact that mutations will cause all populations to go extinct over time, and that we cannot survive as a population when these things are getting added into the genome, evolutionists will still claim that natural selection will somehow preserve us. But this is absolutely false, and here's why. Because natural selection itself can only select away a certain amount of mutations. It cannot select away all of the deleterious mutations that are getting added into these systems over these generations. Okay, you've asserted that repeatedly now, but can you back it up? Have you run the numbers? Where have you published your data set? How are you determining which mutations are beneficial, which are neutral, and which are detrimental? Or are you just assuming that most mutations are bad and that the whole genome is functional, therefore you are right? Because if that's your assumption, it is demonstrably wrong, as shown by the fact that the human population is able to grow without everyone having at least a few hundred children. What that means is, that natural selection can only slow down the deleterious information getting added in, but cannot halt the deleterious information from getting added in to these generations. You do know that not every mutation is destined to become fixed in a population, right? Like, that's the whole point of natural selection. Variation exists, and the variations that can reproduce the best are the ones that do. You seem to be assuming that all mutations are not only bad, but equally bad, and occur at the same frequency throughout every member of the population. Actually, you know what? I think that might be giving you too much credit. I don't think you even understand it well enough to be able to articulate that. You just hear mutation bad and decide that that counts as evidence for creation somehow. So this is why evolution is false. This is why creation science is fact and is true. It is based on what we know. Not what we think we know, but what we know. Eh, you haven't demonstrated that you know much of anything, so I'm just going to go ahead and call bullshit on that. You see, evolution is based on inference. It's based on, well, if changes over time can get added up, you'll change from a fish to a fisherman over generations. It's false. That's not an inference. That's a fact. We know things change. We watch things change. It happens all the damn time. It's such an obvious fact that creationists have to account for it in their ridiculous, I don't want to use the term model because that implies a certain amount of internal coherence, which doesn't exist in creationism, view. Sure. Creationists love to claim that there are certain barriers that prevent these changes from accumulating over time, but I have never once seen any creationist propose a mechanism that would actually stop that from happening. So on the evolution side, we're saying that something that we observe happening happens, and on the creation side they're saying that something we observe happening happens but then stops happening because reasons, even though that's not what we see. It's just an assumed part of creationism. If you add deleterious information over time to populations, it will only cause the extinction of those populations as they go downhill and not uphill. That statement, taken in isolation, is mostly true. I say mostly because it's still not actually true. You'd have to exclude beneficial mutations altogether in order for that statement to be true by itself, and that statement doesn't explicitly exclude them. 
probably because, as Matt himself admitted earlier in the video, they are a thing that exists, and as soon as they exist alongside the deleterious ones and the neutral ones, natural selection goes to work and prevents the inevitable decline that Matt is describing here. Why would they go downhill? Once again, because a mutation is going to cause deleterious information to get added. Remember, these are errors getting added to populations over generations. Folks, this is why our side is so powerful, and this is why evolutionists and atheists, they fail every time. Sure, keep telling yourself that, Matt. You regularly fail to understand even the most basic of scientific concepts. But in space, wouldn't it be a different scenario based on the fact that, you know, the, 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 the space and the air in the space is much different than the air we have here? That out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. The dinosaurs they discovered have, um, the dragons they discovered have chambers in the back of their head. It's where they can breathe fire. But that's just a couple things. I mean, if it's about survival of the fittest and we evolved from African Americans into other Americans, what about the African Americans that are still alive today? Well, I don't see anything wrong with quote mining. I believe if we study history, you know, the Confederates were able to shoot pterodactyls. T-Rex, they had short, stubby arms. And apparently now the chicken's able to do a handstand with those arms. Think about this. We have more in common genetically in certain areas with a gorilla than with an ape. Yet they say genetically we evolved from apes. We can tell based on genetics. Honestly, John, I don't know a ton of technical terms. I'm very simple when it comes to science. I, I just enjoy simple science. But sure, it's us who fail every time. Because their theory itself is based on fiction films rather than reality. Okay, so if evolution is based on fiction films, then how do you explain the fact that Darwin published his book nearly three decades before the invention of the motion picture camera? Unless you mean still photography, in which case I could be pedantic and point out that flexible film wasn't invented until around the same time as the motion picture camera, before that they were using photographic plates. But photography certainly existed for most of Darwin's life. And my main point here is that I don't think even Matt knows what point he's trying to make with this statement. Think about it. They think that we evolved from a sponge, like somebody off of SpongeBob SquarePants. You do realize that SpongeBob was modeled after sea sponges and not the other way around, right? Like, coyotes do sometimes chase roadrunners, but that doesn't mean that we really think that they do it in Looney Tunes fashion with elaborate traps, Acme rockets, and painted tunnels turning into real tunnels and stuff like that. And yes, there was probably something similar to a sea sponge in our ancestral lineage if we go back far enough. Your incredulity at this fact does not disprove it, nor does it provide evidence for creation. They think that your ancestor was that of a fish, just like off of Mr. Limpet. Glad to see you're keeping your references relevant. The Incredible Mr. Limpet is a movie from 1964. I would have gone with Luca myself, that's a more recent movie that features fish. Well, the main characters are sea monsters rather than fish, the fish are portrayed as equivalent to basically sheep. So maybe Finding Nemo? At any rate, the same thing applies here. Your incredulity is not an argument against evolution. Many people today think that we have an ancestor like that of Curious George. That our ancestor was a literal primate. Hate to break it to you, Matt, but you are a literal primate right now. Because humans are primates. Well, maybe Matt isn't. One of the characteristics that defines primates is having a large brain. I'm not saying Matt doesn't have a large brain, but I haven't seen any evidence that he does. But yeah, if your brain to body ratio is larger than other mammals, you have a fissure in the brain separating the first and second visual areas on either side of the brain, you have fingernails, you have hands adapted for grasping, few offspring, usually one at a time, and complex social groups, then congratulations, you're a primate. If you don't think you're a primate, I'd be curious to know which of these features you don't think you have. That had to slowly evolve, and over generations, Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, all the way up the chain to where we are today. Yes. It might not have been specifically Australopithecus afarensis that was our ancestor, but it would have been something much like it. But notable here is that if we look at the creationist literature, they can't even decide where to draw the line between human and non-human ape. In AIG's Answers Research Journal, an explicitly creationist journal if there ever was one, there is a debate about whether the species known in secular circles as Australopithecus sediba should actually be considered human and thereby reclassified as Homo sediba. If the differences between humans and other apes were so clear, you would think that creationists would at least be able to agree on which species are human and which are non-human ape. 
But the differences are, in fact, so small that some creationists will consider this hominid to be a human, while others will consider it to be a non-human ape. Like, here's two skulls. One of these is pretty much universally considered by creationists to be fully human, while the other one is the Australopithecus sediba, which some creationists consider to be fully human and others consider to be fully non-human ape. I'm curious, Matt, which one do you think is the human and which is not? Do you think Australopithecus sediba is a human? In which case you've now agreed that there is not a significant barrier between an Australopithecine and a human, as the specimen is close enough to the other Australopithecine to be officially classified with them, with only creationists disagreeing and saying that they are closer to humans. Now remember, the reason that things like cancer exist is because of mutations. Yes, but also remember that the reason Nickelback exists is because of the invention of the electric guitar. Just because cancer, I mean Nickelback, is one outcome does not mean it's the only potential outcome. So this proves that we did not start off as goo. The fact that mutations can cause disease does not prove that common ancestry is impossible. And was our common ancestor gooey? Perhaps, perhaps not. It doesn't matter. That's just another hyperbolic creation statement meant to evoke feelings of incredulity because when you don't have any data or evidence on your side, appeals to emotion are about all you have left. This proves that we did not start off as a rock. No, we did not start out as a rock. That is a ridiculous straw man that both you and Kent have been corrected on many times before. Your insistence on continuing to use that straw man serves to show that you are not interested in learning or being accurate with your information. And yes, that is what evolution teaches, is that we all descended from rocks, that granite rock had chemical elements inside of it, and when it was raining for two million years, that those heavy chemical elements were eroded from the rocks, and then we evolved from those heavy chemical elements. Nope. It's more that we evolved from the initial organisms who would have made use of those elements in their biochemistry. But that does not make those organisms descendants of rocks. Matt, you need to ingest a certain amount of salt in order for your biochemistry to continue its proper functioning. Salt is, quite literally, a rock. You use rocks in the same way as the initial organisms on the Earth would have used them, as part of your biochemistry. So if you're going to claim that this means that we think the first organism was a rock, then that means that you yourself are a rock. You certainly are as dense as one. Yet they will deny the fundamental of their faith. Because they don't want to admit how stupid it sounds. It only sounds stupid when it's being strawmanned by creationists. And I know it's been said a million times already, but as long as you keep bringing up this evolve from a rock nonsense, it bears repeating. You literally believe that God made human beings out of dirt. Dirt is a combination of rock, moisture, and decaying organic matter. As God made us on the sixth day, there wouldn't have been any time for the organic matter to build up, and you guys don't even think there was any decay before the fall anyway, so it wouldn't have been decayed organic matter. So it would have just been rock and moisture. So in the creationist view, we are literally descended from a man who was made out of rocks, and then a woman who was made out of his rib, followed by massive amounts of incest, followed by a mass genocide that resulted in even more incest. But yeah, self-replicating molecules that made use of mineral elements is the stupid sounding idea here. To say that your ancestor was a rock while mocking the idea that we all descended from a single set of parents, that requires a great amount of primitive superstition. The projection is strong with this one. It's always weird to me when creationists do that. They take things that they actually believe, and then they basically admit that they are ridiculous by projecting them onto the evolutionary view, as if to say, you guys are as bad as us believing in primitive superstition and using faith. The difference here is that evolution has 150 years of extensive research supporting it, while creationism has, I have a book, and I can quote mine some of the research in a way that makes it look like it might be wrong if you don't read the rest of the context. So, for the record, in this video called The Best Argument for Creation Science, we now have 1 minute and 12 seconds left, and he has yet to even make a single argument that doesn't start with the assumption that if evolution is wrong, his brand of creationism must then be true. This whole thing has been focused on attempting to point out problems with evolution, and it hasn't even done that very well. To make fun of the idea that it could rain for 40 days and 40 nights, while believing yourself that it rained for 2 million years. The problem with the Noah story is not the amount of time it was supposed to have rained. That's the least problematic part of the story by a long shot. With regards to the rain, it's more that the amount of water that would have had to have been in the rain would have been strong enough to destroy the ark and kill any animals, including humans, that were in it. 
I already ran the numbers in a previous video, so I'm not going to redo the whole thing here, but being extremely generous to the creationist case, and saying that Mount Ararat was the highest mountain before the flood rather than Everest, and assuming that 75% of the water for the flood was coming out of the fountains of the deep and not from rain, then you would have still needed 85 kilograms of water falling on every square meter of the planet every single minute of every single day for those 40 days in order to accumulate enough water to cover the top of Ararat. So I guess Noah survived the most intense waterboarding session in human history. It is a perfect example of the fallacy of false equivalence. Yes, it actually is. Because the rain on the rocks for two million years, using water that is continually evaporating and then raining down again on the rocks through the water cycle, and doing so at reasonable rates, is in no way equivalent to God blasting every square meter of the whole earth with an adult human's weight in water every minute. But that's not why you think it's a false equivalence, is it? Flinging your own poo onto the Christian. Like the filthy monkeys we are. When you're not able to defend your position, you may fling your own problems onto Christians. I've seen it many times. It really is quite astonishing that he can say that with a straight face right after doing that thing where he accuses evolutionists of having faith and superstition. I've been in debates where this has happened over and over and over again, and they will repeat and regurgitate things that they've been told that are false. So what you're saying is that we should stop saying the same things as other people who hold the same position as us? Kind of like how you just parrot Kent Hovind's talking points while demonstrating, if possible, an even worse understanding than what Kent has? Maybe just take his dick out of your mouth for a second and learn something real. They have things in their mouth I wouldn't hold in my hand. You know, I wouldn't hold that in my hand either, Kent. I don't blame you. And if you're an evolutionist, I would encourage you to watch my videos because they explain why evolution is not true. I watch more of your videos than most people probably do, even your fans. They do no such thing. They just show that you don't understand what you're talking about. Okay, we've got 37 seconds left. Do you think he'll give any evidence for creationism in the home stretch? And if you are open-minded to the idea of God and creation science, then I would encourage you to actually watch these videos with an open mind. I can actually show you why evolution is false, what it teaches, and why it is not true. And to any critics out there who would challenge these ideas, remember, I have debated many of them. I've debated PhDs on this matter of evolution and old earth creationism, and it is false. It is not true. It is not based on science. It is based on opinions of men and the wisdom of this world, which is foolishness with God. God bless. And that's a negative. Not a single bit of evidence in favor of creationism in this whole video. Matt, to the best of my knowledge, you have debated all of one PhD. And it wasn't someone with a PhD in anything biology related, it was a PhD in theology. That would be Kenny Rhodes, the most definitely Christian PhD holder who believes in evolution, and who Matt represented as though he were an atheist. Literally quoted the guy and said that it is unbelievable what unbelievers will say to remain unbelievers. Here, I'll just play it for you. This is unedited except for the removal of Powell's dramatic music. I was in a debate with uh, Dr. Kenny Rhodes from Reasons to Believe, and he, I brought this, this up to him, right? And he looked at me, he goes, well, even though it looks like a man footprint, and anatomically it may be the same, how do you know there wasn't a creature that looked just like a man? Talk about believing things without evidence. Believing, it is unbelievable what unbelievers will believe to remain unbelievers. Unbelievable. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Darker Knight, who says, I have a question. Why do you assume genetic defects, tragedies, and other bad things are because God ordained them? Why do you think they have supernatural agency? Well, first off, I don't. A more appropriate question would be, why do I think that the Christian worldview would agree to that position? And the answer here largely depends on which Christian I'm talking to, but generally speaking, most would say that everything happens according to God's plan, which means that bad things are a part of his plan and are therefore intentional on his part. But there's also the issue that God is supposed to be all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving. With all three of these characteristics, he could have created a world without any genetic defects, tragedies, or other bad things if he so desired. The fact that he did not means that he did not so desire, which means that he cannot be all-loving, or is not all-powerful or all-knowing. 
So either he wanted bad things to happen, or else he was unable to stop the bad things from happening. In one case he's malicious, in the other he loses the all-powerful attribute. So it's not that I assume these things happen because of him, it's that the attributes given to him by Christians don't leave any other option. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, iOS Tilt Bill Gamer, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the sponges that evolved into the ape that is my channel. If you'd like to be a mutant cartoon character, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist. Remember to head to the link in the description for 83% off a search shark subscription. Links to social media, all the ways to support the channel, and to my other projects can be found at links.vicerhino.com. Com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!